up to this point, uh, a lot of these videos, a lot of the content that we've we've done in class has uh, uh, has dealt with types of matter, properties of matter, and, and in those studies, we we have um, discussed matter being made of particles, uh, and we we talked about the the pure particles, uh, compounds and elements being indivisible uh, to an extent. Well, as we go further in, we're going to now begin looking at the, the composition of those compounds and even the composition of, of those elements. How are the elements put together? What makes one element different from the other element? That's what this next series of videos are going to be. We're going to start today with uh, atomic structure. Uh, how are atoms put together? Where atoms are those building blocks of the elements and the elements are the building blocks of the compounds. So we're going to start with atoms and the theory behind uh, atomic structure. So the, uh, the topic of atomic theory is um, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a little bit of challenging to present in a very interesting way because essentially we're just kind of walking through history of science and kind of looking at what different people thought and kind of maybe looking at how they came to their decisions about things. So the, um, uh, the ability to do a lot of really cool uh, examples and demonstrations uh, it, it's kind of limited because it's all, 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 of the, all of the things that are going on in atomic theory are going on down in, at, at, the, uh, at the atom level. And, and as such, you know, we can't really see what's going on with electrons, protons, and neutrons. We can just see the result of what goes on. So doing demonstrations and, and trying to make it lively and interesting um, it's a little beyond what we, what we can do in a basic classroom. So we'll just jump in, we'll kind of walk through the, the history of atomic theory. Um, and it begins, it begins long, long ago, 2,500 years ago, uh, before, the, the, before the Common Era. Uh, the ancient Greeks had some ideas about how the world was put together. And uh, a, a guy by the name of Democritus, he was kind of one of the first people to, to come uh, to be known for ideas about how the world was put together. And, and he said that matter consisted of extremely small particles that could not be divided. And he called these atoms, it's from, from the Greek word um, atomos, which means uncut or indivisible. So he had the idea that, that if we were to take um, a, a substance and continually divide it, and continually divide it, and continually divide it, we're going to eventually get to a place where we can't divide it anymore. It becomes uh, the, that point, as he said, we would reach the, the atom. Of, and he said that each substance had a different kind of molecule. So he said that solid molecules were probably prickly, and they stuck together. Um, and that liquid molecules might be smooth and they would slide around amongst themselves and give the properties that we've already discussed about liquids and solids. So Democritus had some really good ideas. He just, um, his ideas didn't catch on because around his time there was a, another prominent person. And this is kind of a nice little side note to how being famous uh, suddenly automatically gives you credibility. So Aristotle, most everyone uh, has heard of Aristotle. Aristotle did not agree with Democritus. And so because Aristotle was popular, his view was the one that was adopted and, and the one that sort of took over uh, the early, early thinking. And his view was that, that all matter was made of elements. And he said those elements are air, fire, earth, and water. So we have on one hand, we have uh, Democritus, who thinks that uh, all matter is made of, of something called atoms and that every substance had a uniquely different atom. So there'd be like a cheese atom and there would be like a, a water atom. And then we have Aristotle who by virtue of his popularity, whose view caught on more and he said that everything was made of these four elements in, in different combinations. So those, Aristotle's view caught on and went on for literally for, for centuries but by the 1800s, scientists, scientists had enough data from experiments to, to support more substantial atomic models. And uh, um, an, early, an early scientist who had thoughts about this was Dalton. And, and Dalton got a lot of things right. Um, he, he missed out on one point, but let's give him credit for what he got right first. He said that all elements are composed of atoms. So in that way, 
he agreed with he agreed with Democritus. All elements are composed of atoms. So that's that was his first point. And then he said, all the atoms of any given element have the same mass. Again, like Democritus, he said that each atom, uh, each each substance, in his case, he said uh, elements, and each element has its own particular characteristic, its own particular type of atom. So uh, Dalton said, all atoms of the same element have the same mass, and atoms of different elements have different masses. So if I have an aluminum molecule, an aluminum atom, it's going to be different from an iron atom. So Dalton's theory um, was, was kind of close. It, it was similar to what Democritus came up with. Um, Dalton also said that Compounds like water would be made up of combinations of different atoms. And finally, he said, in any particular compound, the atoms of different elements always combine in the same ratio. So, so Dalton took us from this, this view of, the, of, of matter being earth, wind, air, and fire, and combinations of that, more close to the um, modern view where we have compounds are made of elements in fixed ratios. And, and, and Dalton was dealing with the ratios in terms of mass, uh, which was related to what we now look at. So Dal Dalton really, Dalton really kind of got pretty, pretty close with that. Um, he pictured atoms as, as just spheres, and this would be Dalton's, Dalton's picture of an atom, uh, it's from the the Pearson Pearson's sci uh, physical science textbook. Uh, this is uh, page 114 and page 115. So Dalton's Dalton's picture of the atom was just a big sphere, and that every atom had a slightly different sphere. But uh, Dal Dalton thought the spheres were indivisible; that we could not break them down any further than than that. A little while later, Thompson came along. And he was doing experiments with, with gas between charged metal plates. And he began to get some ideas about, uh, about atoms that were uh, a little bit different from Dalton's. What he ultimately concluded was that atoms are made of even smaller particles. Um, he, didn't really try to, he didn't really try to explain how they all completely worked. But, but his breakthrough was that there's positive charges and negative charges, at least those two kinds of things, inside an atom. And, and then they're going to behave uh, differently because of that. So Thompson's experiments provided the first evidence that atoms were made of even smaller particles. So, so, so Thompson took Dalton's theory, and, and rather than just being a sphere, we now have something where we have the positive and negative charges uh, in, in a molecule um, all, all together. And this became what was called the plum pudding. And so, and the, and the idea of the plum pudding model is if you had a, a, a container of plum pudding, interestingly enough, it would have some plums in it and it would have some puddings in it. And the plums, if you stirred it up, the plums would be kind of nicely, nicely scattered around. And he thought that the charged particles inside an atom were just kind of internally scattered around. So that was, that was, that was Thompson's model of the atom, charged particles come together it's not just a big sphere, but it actually you could you could possibly divide that sphere up into parts, and um, so that was that was moving us towards the the more modern view of the atom. Another another scientist came along and followed him, um, and this would have been Rutherford. So so Rutherford Rutherford was kind of playing with the idea of the plum pudding model, and and he was like, okay, if if I can shoot alpha particles through the plum pudding, will they go through or will they get stuck? So what he found out was a lot of them went right through and the ones that didn't go right through deviated off their course drastically. So this becomes, this becomes uh, an example of when a hypothesis turns out to be wrong but leads to a huge advance in, in the scientific understanding. Uh, and in this case, the understanding of, of the atom. So where he thought the, the, any, the ray of uh, alpha particles would behave pretty consistently, what he found was instead there were 
points in the experiment where the alpha particles reacted radically different than what he expected. And the only conclusion that he could come up with was to change the way atoms were pictured. Rather than being a, a relatively consistent sphere, as in Thompson's model, we have to now view atoms as having a dense, compact central core with a lot of space around it. And in that space, Rutherford is going to put um, the electrons. And he's not really trying to decide what the electrons are doing because he's, he's trying to decide about this central core. He's trying to, to do work on that central core piece. He's not really just trying to figure out where every single electron is. But someone who worked with him later, not too much later, uh, Bohr, Bohr comes along and he says, let's look at those, let's look at those electrons. Where are those electrons located? And Bohr concluded through some, some uh, testing and some experiments that they, they must be in particular orbitals, that he, he said, and that these orbitals each represent a specific level of energy. And, and at those energy levels, certain uh, electrons would, would, would locate themselves in each of these orbitals, where, and where each orbital would have a, a different energy level. And we could compare uh, Bohr's model to planets orbiting around a star and where we would have uh, some on the closest orbital. And then as the or energy goes up, they would move further out. And so this was Bohr's model. And, and Bohr's model um, began to inform modern chemistry so that, that we begin to understand how the electron position within the various orbitals uh, it caused certain chemical properties and, and it caused elements to react in similar ways when certain conditions were, were the same and it caused them to act differently when those conditions were, were different. So, so the, the Bohr model uh, was very helpful in, in guiding us into understanding how chemicals um, will combine, how elements will combine to form different, different chemicals. As time went on though, the the simplicity of the orbits and the simplicity of the position of the electrons being in these, these stair-step orbits uh, had to be slightly adjusted, and, and that was adjusted into a, an electron cloud model. Now, this is an interesting model. It, it says, yeah, we have atoms, and they are in orbitals, and there are certain fixed uh, levels of energy for each orbital, but it's not as neat and tidy as just planets going around a circle. So at this closest level, there, 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 the model shows there's, there's two places, almost like an hourglass with the nucleus in the middle. So there's, there's two places where the electrons will be, and it's not a nice, tidy little circles. And then as you go into other orbitals, other uh, energy levels, we have different number of electrons in each of those sets of orbitals. And we have different places and, and, and different uh, energy levels that go along with each one. So, so the electron cloud model, it says indeed we have a dense nucleus in which there are the protons and the neutrons. And we have the electrons that are scattered and widely dispersed outside the nucleus, but we don't exactly know. We can't pinpoint and say, at any given time, the electrons are here, 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 and here. Uh, we can say, at any given time, the, the electrons are in this area, or in this area, or in this area, but we can't exactly say, they're definitely here, definitely here, definitely here. This uh, electron cloud model is going to uh, very, very, very closely connect to our understanding of, of chemistry and how the chemicals and the elements combine. And so we'll be looking at this electron cloud model uh, much more closely and in a, a whole lot greater detail uh, in, in videos to come and in lectures to the class uh, to come as well. So, so we, we can walk quickly through the development of the model of, of atoms. This is we, we can begin over with Dalton. Dalton, Dalton deciding 
that um, all matter is made up of elements and the elements are made up of atoms and the atoms of each element are uh, unique. Thompson, however, discovered that the atoms themselves, the atoms themselves are made up of even smaller particles and he, he, didn't, he didn't exactly say how they were all configured. He just assumed they were all sort of mixed together in what he called the plum pudding model or what became known as the plum pudding model. Uh, Rutherford began with that plum pudding model and trying to prove or find evidence that it was true actually found evidence that it was not true. Rather than everything being kind of equally scattered out, uh, Rutherford concluded that there was a dense central piece in which there is um, the neutrons and the protons, and he put the electrons just in orbits around outside the nu nucleus so that his alpha particles could pass through, and sometimes they would hit the nucleus and bounce off, which gave him the, the results that he wasn't expecting. Bohr went on to look at the electrons more closely and where they are. So Bohr decided that electrons are at fixed energy levels. He got that part right. They're at fixed energy levels and certain numbers of them will appear at each energy level at any given time. And, and then he modeled that in, 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 into like orbits like things on a planet, which turns out to not be an accurate model. Uh, finally, in the... Uh, 1926, uh, Schrodinger does some work and mathematically comes up with this electron cloud model. And, and this model represents that, that the electrons, while they're at fixed energy levels, it's not nice, tidy little orbits, but it's regions around the nucleus in which the electrons are found. So that, that's the, the progression of, of uh, atomic theory. As I said, it's a little bit uh, like a history lesson because it's the history of atomic theory. Uh, and it's, it, there's not a lot of demonstrations that we can do in a classroom setting to make this more exciting. And so um, hopefully you can use this video to just kind of quickly grind through the, the concepts, beginning with the ancient Greeks who um, were thinking about it uh, 2,500 years ago up through the, the development of the electron cloud theory.